Chapter 9, Health Problems of the Newborn. This is where we'll start looking at each age group separately and in more detail. Uh, one of the problems with newborns is birth injuries. They can have soft tissue injuries, uh, head trauma, and I'm sure you talked about these last semester in OB, a caput, a cephalohematoma, or a sub galial hemorrhage. They can also have fractures, usually of the clavicle, facial paralysis, which is usually a result of forcep delivery, brachial palsy, and phrenic nerve paralysis. And here's some pictures. You can see this baby had uh, delivery by forceps, and initially you've got that paralysis, which uh, looks much better 24 hours later. The baby on the, the um, other side of the screen here has the brachial plexus which is called Herb's palsy and you can see that left arm is extended, internally rotated um, with the wrist uh, pronated as well. So what newborns are at high risk? Well, the, the younger they're born and the smaller they are, the higher their risk is. 22 to 24 gestational weeks. These kids um, are possibly viable. Not all will make it, but many of them will. Uh, but they're very high risk. With these kids, we want to really decrease their stimulation when we draw labs, we're going to record exactly how much blood was taken, even if it's, you know, one point, well, it's probably not going to be a full ML, but if they took 0.75, we'd record, record that. If they took 0.3, we'd record that. And it gets added up, and when the, re the blood that's been drawn equals 10% uh, deficit, it's replaced. Usually these kids are going to be drawing things like glucose, bilirubin, calcium, hematocrit, blood gases, and electrolytes. They're also going to need respiratory support. Their lungs are not mature at that age, and they're going to have trouble with thermoregulation. They can't maintain body temperature at that age either. So let's look at thermoregulation. Low birth weight, the babies, they have a smaller muscle mass and they also have less of the brown fat, which is a good insulator. They also have poor reflex control of the skin capillaries. When we're hot, we dilate those capillaries and get a, a little bit of uh, heat lost just by convection. Um, they can't do that. Or constricting those capillaries to keep the temperature in at more at the core, they can't do that. So they need a neutral thermal environment. Uh, this is, will help to reduce their oxygen need and their caloric consumption because they're not having to expend those calories to stay warm. We need to think about heat maintenance uh, in an incubator. At Children's we have the double walled isolates. We can also put them in a radiant warmer. That's your uh, light over the top shining down on the open warmer or wrap them up in blankets in a bassinet depending how small they are the blankets and bassinet are not going to be adequate and we want to really work to reduce evaporative heat loss and insensible water loss and you'll see here this baby's under plastic which helps to prevent that evaporative heat loss and water loss the water simply that you know moisture on our skin doesn't evaporate into the air and with it goes a lot of temperature it also prevents drafts so the baby isn't getting you know cool drafts that, that blow by and wick off some temperature with it moisture and temperature here's the double walled isolates like we use and the control down there on it the blue square or blue rectangle that has controls for temperature so that we are keeping it neutral, neutrothermal and 
you're checking the baby's skin temperature to make sure we're not getting the baby too hot or too cold. They put a cover over the top to give the baby a little uh, relief from the bright lights that are always on in NICU. This baby's wearing a, a cap and booties to prevent heat loss through the head um, and is probably on a radiant warmer on the warming table. Another big concern with these babies is we need to prevent infection. Our biggest uh, tool in preventing infection is hand washing. When you go into NICU, they make you do, I believe it's a one minute scrub. It's not the three minute surgical scrub, but it's more than just your standard 20 second washing at the sink. Equipment needs to be washed and kept clean um, Tubing changes for IV tubing. The policy at Children's Hospital, and this is based on research at Children's Hospitals across the country, tubing for continuous IVs are changed every four days. Anything that's intermittent, so it's disconnected periodically, that's changed every 24 hours. Hydration. Hydration's a problem with these kids. Uh, babies have much more extracellular water. So it's outside the cells, either in the interstitial fluid or in the vascular uh, space. But up to 90% of their water is extracellular, outside the cells. This changes the osmotic pull and it makes them unable to concentrate their urine. So you have decreased osmotic, diure decreased osmotic diuresis from the kidneys dilute urine and they can't change that. They lose water, they get dehydrated, they cannot cha change their urine, they can't concentrate the urine like an adult can. So these kids also because of not really being able to shift fluids around or water around, they can lose water into the GI tract, into the lungs, as well as out onto the skin. So we really need to manage their fluids, giving them parenteral fluids Usually, they'll have an umbilical uh, catheter, um, an umbilical artery catheter. Uh, they may have arterial and venous, but umbilical lines. Uh, we can put in a PIC line, which is the peripherally inserted central catheter, but somehow we have to have uh, lines in to be able to give them fluids. When a child does have a, uh, some sort of IV access, we check the infusion, how much has gone in, and how the site looks every hour. And we want to be real careful with fluid maintenance on these kids. Remember that formula is based on weight, and they don't weigh very much. So we're talking about minimal amounts of fluids, but it's extremely important that we're being accurate on how much we give them. Here's a baby, you can see that plastic over him to prevent drafts, to prevent evaporative uh, heat and water loss. And he's intubated and has the hat and booties on as well to help maintain his temperature. Now nutrition is also a problem. Babies don't get a coordinated sex swallow till about 32 to 34 weeks gestation. And we said we're saving these kids far younger than that, which means they can't be fed by bottle. They also didn't get a gag reflex until they're about 30 week, uh, sorry, 36 weeks. Um, this is going to make them prone to aspiration and reflex. It also means if we're going to tube feed them, we can put it down their mouth. It's not going to trigger a gag reflex. Now their stomachs are very small and have very limited capacity. We can't give them large feedings you'll see a lot of these kids are um, on a continuous feeding of oh, a couple of mLs an hour, very small amounts. If they are bottle feeding, we never want to feed for more than 20 minutes. We'll give them 20 minutes with the bottle and then the rest we put down the OG tube. They're expending too much energy trying to get the nutrition in if we let them go more than 20 minutes. Even very early on, they'll try and do minimal enteral feedings just to stimulate the GI tract, get everything uh, working. And 
Once they get to that age of coordinated second swallow, can we let them on breastfeed? We really like using breast milk. That's the best thing for them. And the answer is uh, usually yes, as long as they're stable. If we weigh the baby before mom feeds and weigh him again after, change nothing in between. No blanket, no diaper, no hat, no nothing. So everything's exactly the same except for the amount of breast milk they took. We can measure. So our scales measure down to the gram. You know, that's about the weight of a paper clip. So we can, can tell exactly how much they took because remember that's the beauty of the metric system. A gram and an ml uh, in water are the same and breast milk is going to be really close there. How much caloric need does a, a premature baby have? About 120 kcals per kilo per day, which is quite high. And looking at their fluid maintenance, um, there's just no way you're going to get the amount of calories without giving them way too much fluid unless you concentrate the formula. Um, we almost always you have them on 22 or 24 calories per ounce, where normal is 20. And sometimes with breast milk, we'll need to add some some extra calories, although breast milk, because they tolerate it so much better often, we don't need to. If you're feeding a, a newborn, especially a premature baby, you want to make sure you have them positioned well, that their head is uh, tipped back just a little bit in that sniffing position so that they can breathe well. So we don't want the head pushed forward where it can pinch off the trachea or hyperextended back which can also pinch off the trachea. You want them up for aspiration and even if you're going to tube feed them unless they're not stable, their blood pressure you know, isn't stable, that sort of thing it's nice to hold them when we feed them. So they associate full tummy, feeling good, being held. They associate that all together and it's a good experience. The other thing is to offer them a pacifier. Again, they've got to be pretty stable to do this, but offering them a pacifier so they equate sucking on the pacifier with their stomach filling up and this nice pleasant feeling of being held so that they tie that all together and feeding becomes a pleasurable experience for them. A couple of nursing alerts in your book that I want to point out. Poor feeding behaviors such as apnea, so they can't breathe and eat, bradycardia, cyanosis, pallor, and decreased oxygenation saturation in an infant who is previously fed well. So this kid used to feed well and now we're having all these symptoms when they feed, this can indicate an underlying illness. Kids shouldn't get worse, they should get better and if you see something they could do that's now looking worse, that's a problem. We need to make sure that uh, we notify the doctor. Another nursing alert, an increase in gastric residuals, uh, so we've probably got an OG down and they hadn't been having residuals or minimal residuals and now they're, they're larger. The abdomen's distended, bilious vomiting, so that's that green bile, temperature instability, they no longer are maintaining their temperature as well as they have, color changes, that skin color, apneic episodes, bradycardia, these may indicate early necrotizing enterocolitis, NEC. And we'll talk about that in just a couple slides. And this also needs to be called to the attention of the practitioner. Those are both uh, potential problems. So care of the neonate. What are we going to do? Uh, one is 